Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. Well, as promised, today I'm going to take you on a tour of our vegetable garden. I'll show you how things are coming along and share some tips along the way. Now, as some quick background, my husband Bill and I live in Spokane, Washington, which is about 300 miles east of Seattle. We are in hardiness zone 5B, although most of the Spokane area is in hardiness zone 6A. Let's get started. Now, Bill and I love raised bed gardening. We actually have been using this method for over 30 years and really swear by it. We have 27 raised beds and I have shot videos on why raised bed gardening is so great. You can find them on my YouTube channel, which is Susan's in the Garden. Now, occasionally you're going to see a bed that has a cover over it. And that's for insect protection for the most part. And so I will explain as we go along why a bed has a cover on it. I use floating row cover, which is this material here, and also agricultural insect netting, and in this particular bed, we're growing red Russian kale. They are very susceptible to aphids and also to cabbage worms. Here in the Spokane area, we can get cabbage loopers, cabbage worms, and diamondback caterpillars. So let's take a look inside the bed. As you can see, the kale plants are doing awesome. They're running down the center of the bed. And you know, if you're kind of so-so about eating kale, what I recommend doing is growing lettuce and then adding a few chopped up leaves of kale to your salads and you'll be amazed at how delightful they are. The small plants that you can see in the foreground are radish plants. I have a row of radishes on either side of the kale and the types I'm growing are purple plum, French breakfast, and wasabi. This next bed is covered with agricultural insect netting. It's also known as garden netting, insect netting, or agricultural mesh. This is awesome stuff. I started using it last year with great success. And this is also one of my hinged raised beds. This is a do-it-yourself project from my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. And it is so great because I can just open it up harvest or weed or tend the plants in some way, close it back down and I know everything is safe. Within this bed, I'm growing Swiss chard and beets. So I've got two kinds of beets, Solyndra and Golden. Both are awesome and they store great. And beets and Swiss chard are members of the beet family. That might sound like a no-brainer. The reason I'm telling you this is because they are very susceptible to an insect called the leaf miner. The adult is a fly. It lands on the leaves, lays eggs. The eggs hatch into little ugly maggots, which tunnel through the leaves and totally ruin the crop in nothing flat. That's why I'm covering this bed with the agricultural insect netting. And I have to tell you something I discovered a few years ago and I'm embarrassed it took this long, but I found out that beet leaves are absolutely delicious. So what I'm doing, in addition to harvesting the Swiss chard leaves, is I'm harvesting the beet leaves every so often and then sauteing them with onions and they make a great side dish or you can freeze them and put them into soups and stews and other things later. You might recall that I'm growing some flowers in the garden, or I should say more flowers than usual, a lot more flowers. And so in this bed, I've got an ornamental carrot called Dacus Dara. I've got some orange snapdragons. I have a really cool new type of cosmos called apricotta. And I have some queenie lime orange zinnias. Now I temporarily have this bed covered with netting and that's because I'm trying to keep the quail away so they won't nibble on the leaves of these different types of flowers. I think the plants are ready to face the world and so I'm going to take the netting off later today. Here's our gutter peed patch and if you have no idea what I'm talking about we start the pea seeds in gutters ahead of time and then 
when it's time to plant them in the bed, we make a trench and we just slide all of the seedlings out into the trench very quickly and easily. And I have videos about that on my YouTube channel. Just look for gutter peas and you'll find them. So this is green arrow and they are about 23 inches tall in theory, according to the package. But as you can see, I'm 5'7", and <laughs> that is not 23 inches. Because of this, we are very good about putting supports around our peas. And this is Ned again, my little buddy. So he uh, is a black-capped chickadee, and he's one of our little buddies here in the garden. Anyway, it's so important to give your peas support no matter what the package says. If it says they do not require support, give them support anyway, because I've tried that in the past. What happens is they grow up to a certain point, they fall together in this big massive heap, and it's a nightmare to harvest peas from them. So anyway, these are doing great. We've got all sorts of pods on them, and there are even some that are very close, like a couple of days from being able to be harvested. Now this is one of Bill's beds. <laughs> we do have a delineation here and there. <laughs> And in it, he is mainly growing both green and red cabbage. However, he also has interplanted them with bok choy. And those make fantastic salads. They're great in stir fries and so on. We have this agricultural netting in place because we want to keep away the aphids and the cabbage worms. But I do have something I wanted to let you know about, something new that we discovered this year. So on this bed of cabbage and bok choy, which are both members of the cabbage family and both susceptible to aphids and cabbage worms, we're using this agricultural insect netting to keep those beasties away. Last year, we had no problems whatsoever. This year, we think we have discovered that if a leaf is touching the surface, a moth could land on the surface of the netting right where the leaf is lay an egg at an opening and somehow either the egg hatches and the caterpillar goes through to the plant or the egg is actually touching the leaf surface because we had a couple of plants that had a cabbage worm on them. That is not good. So here's a quick peek at the plants. These are the green cabbages, and then there's some purple ones over here. They are growing really well. This big plant is one of the bok choys, and so we're trying to rapidly harvest those so that there's a little less crowding going on in the bed. This next bed is where I'm growing broccoli, but of course I told Bill that it would be fine to plant some bok choy in there, and we have got a ton of it. It's a lovely problem to have, and we've been eating it like crazy. But one of my theories is that if the bed is so crowded, there are leaves that are probably going to touch the inside of the netting. And you'll notice that in this bed, I have taller hoops, and I planted the broccoli a bit away from the edges of the bed but there are some leaves that are touching the netting. And Bill was telling me last night that he saw some holes in one of my leaves, so I'm gonna take a look, see if I can find it. Okay, here's a quick peek inside the bed. And one of the things I would suggest, first of all, it's so important whether your beds are covered or not, to always check your garden on a regular basis because the earlier you see a problem, the more options you have for dealing with it. I do see a couple of bok choy leaves with holes in them. Minimal damage, but yeah, I'm gonna have to really look closely. I would recommend when you're growing something that's going to be pretty tall, like a broccoli plant, use taller hoops if you can. And this is just something to be aware of. I still am crazy about this netting. I love how you can see through it, 
see how the plants are doing without having to pull the cover off. But again, keep an eye on your plants. Always monitor your garden regularly to see how the plants are doing. Now you've seen this bed a few times before. This is where I'm growing lettuce. I started a bunch early indoors and planted them. And actually we had such a cold late winter, early spring that these didn't do as well as I would have liked or as well as they normally do. But we have been harvesting the butter crunch and rosso leaves and they are fantastic. I did plant some more lettuce in here too. And this one is being protected primarily from birds because they love to peck at lettuce leaves. Okay, we're finally in row two of the beds and I promised to pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> so now we wanna take a look inside the hoop house. This is something that Bill made quite a few years ago. And if you're interested in how it works and how he put it together, the supplies and so on, if you go to my blog, susansinthegarden.com, do a search on the words hoop house project and you'll find all the specs there. So let's peek inside. In the bed on the left, I'm growing Alibaba watermelon. I'm very excited because it is supposed to yield, I think it's eight to 15 pound melons in 75 days time. That is really great for a short season. So I'm gonna give that a go. And if you see those snakes there, that was just to keep quail from coming in and pecking at the seedlings. And you also might recall from my previous video, if you did see it, that I put some little barriers in the doorways to keep quail from walking in here. And then on the right hand side, those are Supremo determinant tomatoes. They're supposed to be a fantastic paste tomato for making things like sauce, ketchup, salsa, and so on. I should also mention that I'm growing these two crops in the hoop house to give them a little bit of extra warmth. But now at this point, I'm able to keep both doors open. So there's good cross ventilation and pollinators will be able to find their way in here. Ordinarily, Bill uses the hoop house to grow his peppers, but he decided to plant them outside. In this next bed, I'm growing carrots and parsnips. Now the parsnip seeds didn't germinate all that well, which is very common with them. So I just have about 12 growing, but that's fine. And then I have the carrots in the other three beds. And with those, I thinned them in the last video so that they have enough room for the roots to develop. I still have it covered with bird netting because I do know that the quail will peck on those leaves and can't be having that going on. Next up is the squash arbor. This is made from a cattle panel, also known as a livestock panel that goes up and over a pathway. And then we grow different kinds of squash and pumpkins up and over it, which is very cool. I am being a much better gardener and a better example this year because last year I got a little carried away when I was doing my seed starting and I put way too many seedlings in here. So this time I've done just two kusha winter squash and three sugar pumpkin plants. There's also a tomato plant down on the end. That is my beloved chef's choice orange, best slicer ever. And that was the only place I had for it. So it gets to grow up the arbor too, which is fine. On the other side, I was much better as well. I have just three potimarron winter squash plants. That makes a small bright orange squash, great for eating. And then the other row has autumn frost, which is another wonderful winter squash. So with a little luck, it won't be quite so crazy in here and everybody will have the room they need in order to grow up and over the arbor. In this next bed, we're growing shallots here. The rest are hard neck garlic, primarily German porcelain. And there's something very important I wanna show you about these plants. Now this is always hard to show, but I'm gonna do my best. Do you see how there's kind of a stalk that's coming out of the middle of this garlic plant? This is what is known as a scape. 
And what it means is the plant wants to bloom. But if you let it bloom, the plant is going to put all of its energy into the flower and that will be at the expense of the size of the bulb that you get to harvest this summer. So what you need to do, don't clip them off yet, wait until they form a complete loop or a complete curly cue, then clip them off. Don't put them in your compost pile, don't throw them in the trash because these are absolutely delicious. What you can do is chop them up, parboil them in boiling water for a couple of minutes, and then saute them in butter or olive oil. Add them to your dinner. Oh my gosh, they are absolutely delicious. So keep an eye on your plants. And I should also mention, you only get garlic scapes on hard neck varieties. So you won't see this happen on the soft necks. If this is your first year to grow garlic, first of all, that's very cool. Second of all, if you're wondering how in the world do you know when it's time to harvest the garlic, what you want to do is wait until the lowest four to five leaves on a plant have died and turned brown. And you don't want, oh, <laughs> and you don't want to just pull them up out of the soil by their stalks. You want to carefully getting a little bit of harassment here. You want to carefully dig them up either with a fork. <laughs> okay, Ned, you're not helping matters. <laughs> you want to dig them up either with a shovel or with a spading fork because you don't want to damage that basal plate, which is the bottom of the bulb when you're digging them up. So wait until the lowest four to five leaves have died then you get to harvest them. In this next bed, I'm growing more flowers. So I have some zinnias here, snapdragons. And this is an overwintered artichoke. It is coming up here. And so I'm trying to give it a bit of room. And then I also have put in some marigolds and some sunflowers. Now in my last video, I talked a little bit about how we're growing potatoes in grow bags. The bags are about 15 gallons in size each. And I had filled in more potting soil around them, some compost and then grass clippings on the top to protect any potatoes that are growing near the soil surface. The varieties we're growing in the foreground, that is Yukon Gem. And in the background there on the right, that is Elba. Okay, we're finally in row three. I wonder what's growing under here. It's another bed that has row cover on it, so that must mean there are potential insect issues that I'm protecting against. Okay, I've got arugula here and turnips here. And both of these are members of the cabbage family, so I'm keeping them protected from aphids and also from cabbage worms. The plants over here are spinach. These are members of the beet family. So again, beets, spinach, and Swiss chard, and I am protecting them from leaf miners. I do see that there's a couple of munch marks on some of the spinach leaves, and that would be slugs. So I'm gonna to have to deal with that too. Fortunately, there is an organic slug bait called Sluggo that works well. In these next two beds, I'm growing my traditional paste tomatoes. And on the left is Federley, and on the right is Gilberti. Both of those are sort of tried and true varieties for us. Although maybe next year I should try some new ones. If you haven't seen this support system that I use for my tomato plants, I've got heavy duty fence posts pounded in and then this is a sheet of concrete reinforcing wire. Been using it for years and it provides nice sturdy support for the plants. This is probably everybody's favorite part of our vegetable garden. It is the pole bean arbor. And this is what's really got me started on vertical gardening. I bought these in 2008 from a local garden center of our Kroger store or Fred Meyer. Everybody asks me where I got them, and you know, they probably don't even have them anymore, but I think it's sort of your basic trellis shape. 
But anyway, so there are four trellises put together, spaced a few inches apart. And what I'm doing this year is for the first trellis, I'm growing a cucumber called Mini Me, new variety to me, but I'm hoping it's great. And then the rest are pole beans, and they are Fortex. I started growing that variety last year because they're more heat tolerant. They did amazingly well and probably gave us more beans than we really needed. So that's why I thought it was okay to dedicate one of the trellises to the cucumbers. On the outsides, on this side, I'm growing celery. And on this side, I've got a few basil plants and some sorrel. In this next bed, Bill is growing some grape tomatoes. He loves making fresh salsa with them. And we are really looking forward to that harvest. In this last bed in row three, I'm growing two different kinds of squash. These three are a zucchini called Coco Zell. They are fantastic. And then the other squash plants are something brand new to me. The name is Burpees Butterbush Butternut. So they are going to grow more in bush form rather than a vining form. And they only take 75 days to reach maturity, which is fantastic because ordinarily butternut is kind of barely workable in our climate. So I'm very excited to try this one. Even though these aren't veggies, I just thought I'd point out that there are two raised beds along the side of our garden that are raspberries. Mostly it's canby red raspberries and fall gold, which are the beautiful golden berries. In this 16 foot long bed, Bill is growing peppers in the foreground. That's almost half of the bed. And then in the chicken wire cage, I just put that over the area because I decided to plant some more seeds of those butternut squash. And I decided I better protect them for a bit. Behind them is where I'm growing some sunflowers and marigolds. That's where all the sticks are sticking out of the ground. And this is something I showed in my last video where I was doing that to keep the quail away from pecking on the leaves. Now you'll notice this bed is empty and that's actually on purpose. We decided to plant this one variety of corn a little bit later than we do, although not that much later. So that's waiting for us to start the seeds indoors and then transplant them out here. And then you'll recall seeing the pea bed a little bit ago. And once they are finished, we will start another crop of corn in that bed. These are our two main beds of onions. And you'll recall from an early video this year that I'm doing a little bit of an experiment. I wanted to test growing onions from seeds, from sets, those little bulbs you can buy in garden centers, and from plant starts. So in this bed, I've got three rows of onions that were started using the winter sowing method from seed and they are really starting to put on some nice growth. Then I've got three rows of onion sets. This is a white onion. And then you can maybe see the largest plants which are on the far side of this bed. Those are Walla Walla Sweets, which I started from plant starts that I bought at the garden center. Now this is a bill bed. So in the first three rows, there are peppers that he started from seed. If you haven't seen my videos before, you need to know that Bill absolutely loves different kinds of peppers, both sweet ones and hot ones. And then there is a row of more grape tomatoes on this little trellis here. He's got some elephant garlic growing in the corner. There are chives over on this side, so there's a lot going on in this bed. And just in case you thought we don't have enough peppers growing yet, this is a small raised bed that Bill has five more peppers growing in. I think we're in good shape. And last but not least, Bill is growing sweet potatoes in our greenhouse. They are each in about 20 gallon size pots. And you'll notice he put a little support system around them with some tree branches. Okay, we made it. I hope you enjoyed the tour. And even more so, I hope that your vegetable garden is coming along really great. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.